Hello and welcome back to Bard's Tale 3. This is Jay Rodman. Uh, today we are uh, continuing our exploration of Canestia. We're in a place called Sanctum, and I get the feeling that this is the Sanctum of Ermac. This is where Ermac resides, probably, uh, and that will probably and meeting him one way or another should uh, conclude our adventures. Uh, Ferrofist himself sent us down here to to put an end to Ermac, to kill him off, uh, I assume. Just, I forget his exact words. Uh, so let's unpause the game and start exploring. To the west we have a trap and an odd. Uh, and there's also a trap to the west from here. Oh, and to I, uh, to clarify, I through some kind of like horrible snafu, uh, I'm still learning to use this new microphone, and it was on mute the entire session. So I'm adding commentary after the fact. So there will be times when I don't actually remember what I'm doing. One of the reasons I've been trying to be very um, I don't know proactive uh, in trying hard to say what I'm doing in this game is because. If, if no one says what's going on, it's going to be difficult to tell what's going on. Even for me, who just played it an hour ago or so. Anyway, uh, my first guess is who traps down on the level. And uh, it's... Uh, it's time to start uh, verifying... Oh, right, I forgot to put the uh, stairs down. Or the portal down, as it were. And by using Sorcerer's Slave from different directions, I'm going to start trying to figure out where those traps are. So for the, to the west here, we have both a trap and an odd. Take a guess where they are. I'll figure it out later. And we're ambushed. These are new enemies, uh, the steel goblins, the petrifiers. I don't think we've ever seen them before, so I'm keeping this fight in. The petrifiers sound scary. They sound like they could turn me to stone. Uh, I don't think that's a big stretch of the imagination. Uh, so I'm going to prioritize killing off the petrifiers first. So I'm attacking them with my two uh, frontliners with their stone blades. Of course, Akil's compass is standard. Uh, the question here is, does my thief have any items that are good for doing damage in significant quantities um, that are preferable to hiding as standard? Uh, it's been about a week or so since I last played, so I couldn't remember exactly what my equipment status was. I decided no and used the standard spells of Fatal Fist, Mangar's Mallet, two Mangar's Mallets, and hope that's enough to kill off the nasty creatures before I get petrified. The one thing that's happening here that I didn't expect is the steel goblins are stealing from me. Uh, S-T-E-A-L, stealing. I don't know if that's sort of intended to be a pun. Um, I kind of think it is, but it seems pretty cheesy and wonky. Um, I never figured out in this uh, level whether the steel go goblins, which kept stealing from me here and there, we're taking items. I think maybe they do not take items because I never noticed any missing. Perhaps they steal money. 
which is no thing. I don't care if they steal some money. I have so much money. And in this fight, the petrifiers uh, did not manage to petrify anyone. But my initial hunch was correct. Uh, later, a fight that um, I edited out does man did manage to petrify one of my uh, petrify Grizzanok actually. So the uh, rewards here, I think, are just experience points and gold. Oh, and of course, more gems. Oh, and the Sorcerer's Hood. So the Sorcerer's Hood, I um, I decided it was not good. Um, I think I confused it with something else. I traded out, tried it out later um, after this level. And it's sort of a mixed bag. So uh, the Sorcerer's Hoods are unlimited use, but you can use them. And they cast Mage Maelstrom, which is a very unimpressive attack spell. So if all they did was Mage Maelstrom and there, I just set off that trap. And that, of course, tells me where it really is. So I'm moving it. Um, if Mage Maelstrom is not really worth using... Uh, it's like in the damage range of like a hundred or so, which is just way too low for now. But it does improve your armor class by three, uh, which may be of some use for my mages. I, I haven't really thought about it. But at least during this time recorded, um, I pretty much eventually dumped them. Anyway, heading south, uh, we can see there's a, a pattern of alcoves in a sort of corrugated wall, and I don't I don't know why, but um, Bard's Tale Three gives you this high expectation of regularity that I never got in Bard's Tale One for certain. Was that one would show you a pattern, then it would break it? Um, was sort of a common theme. Anyway, but here I get this expectation that there's going to be a whole bunch of these corrugated walls and there's going to be a repeating pattern within them. Here I'm already getting a hunch that the alcos may all have traps in them. So by going around to the east and trap zapping facing west, I can get rid of only the trap I know about. A fogger is, I think, a new enemy, so um, I chose to leave this in. And I figured they're 60 feet away, I'll just use Shade Lances and ranged spells and sneak my rogue along. And it'll surely fall before it does anything real, but maybe I'll find out what it does. But it seems to be pretty spell resistant. Uh, kind of unexpectedly so. It's possible that, you know, as a fogger, it's sort of cold aligned. So that my night lances, which are also cold aligned, are unlikely to work. But um, it seems to resist other spells too. So it may just have a very high resistance. Meanwhile, it's also kicking out these uh, breath attacks, or at least group attacks, that are doing around 100 damage to all my party members. So pretty soon it becomes time to change tactics. 
let's pull, uh, try, I'm trying to use melee men to pull them in, or pull it in, him in. Does robots, do robots have a gender? I don't know. But he resists um, the melee men as well. So, okay, now it's time to get serious. Uh, start casting things like luck and anti-magic to lower their resistance. And try melee men again. This, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I finally get success this way. There we go. Now that they're in range, the stone blades uh, should make quick work of him. Uh, it's in range. And down he goes. I started finding crystal gems, and for a while I ignored them. I thought, crystal gem? Right, I have tons of those. I kind of forgot that um, most of the items I have are, are harmonic gems. So what's the difference between a crystal gem and a harmonic gem? Uh, crystal gems have a number. They say crystal gem number one, crystal gem number three. So they have charges. Basically they're denser harmonic gems. Harmonic gems that have multiple charges, which is pretty handy, I guess. Um, I already have too many harmonic gems, so getting multi-use harmonic gems is sort of threatening to be even more too many, but I could start getting more aggressive about carrying fewer of them around. Um, most of this uh, level session actually I spend with nearly full inventories, partly because of the um, various items, uh, quest items I'm carrying around, as well as the very old now uh, night lance back from Arborea that my rogue still has. So I'm going to clear those out soon. They'll give me a few, a little more breathing room of inventory. At the end of the level, I did a whole bunch of uh, shopkeeping, no, uh, upkeep, and threw away items I'll probably never use or put them in storage. Um, so between those two things, inventory should become less of a problem. Uh, the harmonic gems don't seem like they're very crucial in terms of tactics, partly because I don't get into any long fights. I could imagine that later there might be a boss or a hard fight where it goes many, many rounds. If so, then the gems could matter. Uh, or if I get into a somehow into a difficult dungeon where I'm uh, burning spell points faster than I'm collecting gems, then the gem density I'm carrying could matter. Right now, it seems like a curiosity. So getting back to um, the exploration that we're doing, uh, we've confirmed that there are traps in each of the alcoves along the south edge. And we found the western edge, so it's time to copy over the north-south coordinates. I used scry sites to verify my position, and it was exactly as expected. 12 west, 2 south. Compass refresh time, and time to head east along the south wall. Uh, mostly I'm interested in whether there are any just special squares I missed, but while I do it, uh, I'm going to check to the south to see if my sorcerer's site can identify anything. I just identified a trap. I was going fast, so I didn't even know how far I was, so I didn't even know where I was. I just figured I would go all the way across and stop if I found anything interesting. So at 9 west, there's a trap on the wraparound. And from one away from the wall, I can't detect it. 
So that means I know it's three from the top. If this level is symmetrical entirely, that means it's in an alcove on the north edge because uh, one away from, you know, next to the north wall would be one, one away from it, we can see this space is too wide and three away would be in an alcove. But for now, I'm just gonna put them somewhere up there because I don't really know exactly how um, far this level goes north. So that steel serpent uh, was quickly killed. Not very exciting. More crystal gems, which I think I still didn't even notice at this point. But I've talked enough about them. Um, the anticipation here is kind of pleasant. Uh, I'm still checking out all the traps on the wraparound. I just have this wonderful feeling um, that is, you know, Ermac is here somewhere. I don't have to charge in to find him. I'll I'll find him eventually. He'll be here somewhere. There's a bit of silence on the opposite side. That signals to me, um, well, it's different, right? We have uh, trap, space, trap, space, etc. And then we have silence. And to me that says, probably that's the way in. So fighting these uh, siphons, petrifiers, and metal men. I know the siphons can do reasonable damage, but I'm still afraid of the petrifiers. So I focus my attacks on the petrifiers and of course do my usual battery of one Fatal Fist and two Mangar's Mallets along with a, um, what is that called? Keel's Overture, which is running right now. It's a pretty reliable way to kill everything, but it doesn't kill anything all that fast. And meanwhile, uh, they've hit Grisnok and turned her into a statue. This is uh, not what I was hoping for. It's actually not a very, on its own, it's not very severe, right? Uh, one of my sources of damage, a kind of minor one actually, has been knocked out. I can cast a spell to make her no longer a statue, but in the interim, she gets knocked to the back of the party. I quickly look up uh, what it spell it is that turns people no longer into stone, because I couldn't remember. I was thinking, is stone touch the stone to flesh spell? Sorry, is S-T-O-N the stone to flesh spell, or is S-T-O-N the stone touch spell? And it's stone to flesh, so... That question satisfied. It's time to proceed with killing the rest of them as much as possible. So I determined Stone to Flesh is not a Chronomancer spell. I didn't think it was, but I didn't check. But even turning her back into flesh it leaves her at the back of the party where she can't attack. So if that was to happen a lot more, I'd be in trouble. Like perhaps Lady Ogunshield would be turned to stone and or, or more. And at that point, my two fighters would kind of be unable to do their instant kills and my mages would start getting exposed to direct attacks and they have kind of terrible armor class by comparison. So that was a little worrisome, but ultimately, um, not serious. So it's time to, um, after reordering, start my bard song up again. And I accidentally press 7 um, and play Keel's Overture, which I'd never heard before. I don't think I've ever heard this song at all. So let's let it play a bit. It's kind of nice. And 
In fact, uh, let's turn the volume up on the in-game music. The end of the phrase there has a weird quality. It's like it's like trying to bridge to some other part that isn't there. Anyway, um, on with the exploration. And as part of that, switch back to the armor improve armor improving song, which is pretty important. As I mentioned early on, uh, armor not only reduces your chance to be hit, but increases your chance to hit enemies, um, and it's a very precipitous fall off where they go from hitting you, you know, always, to hitting you sometimes, hitting you infrequently, to hitting you basically not at all. <laughs> so here I'm again um, going through the process of uh, cross-referencing that there are traps in each alternating row as in, in each probably in each alcove and then also checking from the south to verify that I'm not wrong about the location and immediately after the check doing the trap zap so verifying the trap location and precisely removing the trap so that if there are any others I can detect them accurately there went a combat you don't need to know about that. I'm starting to try to aggressively uh, use gems even when I still have spell points left, basically because uh, I'm worried about running out of inventory slots. If there was one change that probably I would recommend over all others to the series, it would be more inventory space. It's manageable. Uh, it's not like it's an ever-present concern. Well, I don't know, maybe it's more inventory space and a saner loot system where you don't have to pick things up if you don't want them. But it would definitely make it more... Um, it would remove some tedium without affecting the game balance in any real way. You might have to do more changes to make it be non-balance changing. Like... Uh, have the extra inventory space be in a bag that no one could access in combat. You know, similar to Dragon Warrior or, or Dragon Quest. Which would be fine.
at some point, of course, I start to wonder um, where those odd locations are. Like, is this one of those scenarios where the entire interior of this box is odd squares? That wouldn't be too surprising, given that a couple level ago, levels ago we encountered exactly that. Of course, now I found the north edge of the inter inner box, and also the north edge of the level, which means I can draw the outer walls, and uh, in turn move those guess those guesses I placed up at the top, which were supposed to be two away from the wall, to their expected locations. And sure enough, the, the sort of corrugated or um, in and out shape continues. I was sort of expecting to see something interesting in the middle from here, but maybe I can't actually see the middle from here. Anyway, time to check out the far west wall and see what my sorcerer's site can detect as I go. I'm expecting to find a uh, trap at every uh, even north-south latitude, because that's where I expect alcoves to be on the east side. There's one. There's a lack of one, and there's one. If I want to get really paranoid, I could check from one back, which I think I do once or twice, but at this point it seems glaringly obvious how it will play out. Six brass renders dead, they happen to poison, they don't do much. This wand of force interests me. I think I think to my, I, I was pretty interested in it, I wanted to know what it did. Uh, I tried it out in the next fight, and the result was, um, well, I moved it off of Lillian, because Lillian's pretty much always using the Master Wand, so I moved it over to Griselda, but the intent was to have Griselda use it and see what it did. Uh, what happened was, Griselda casts a spell, dot dot dot. Um, that makes me think it might be a buff, maybe it actually does the shield spell? If I find another one, I'll have to use it at a alternate time where it's easy to see what happens. Like with no buffs running. It didn't even change my armor class, so it wasn't a wall of force like protecting me that way. I mean, it could have been... I mean, wall of force, it doesn't say wall of force, but uh, it's a classic Dungeons and Dragons spell, and these games were definitely channeling Dungeons and Dragons to a large degree. It was a very dominant force in the realm of fantasy gaming at the time. Still influential, but not nearly so ridiculously dominant as it once was. More inventory clearing, and now on to the north side of this level. As, often, as, as always happens, when something wants to join my party, I say no. But oftentimes I'm usually turning to the right and the no gets stated before I even think about it. So from here I advanced a bit, you can see a, a door in the, in the edge. So we have a variation and also it meets my expectations. My expectations was there would be a way in there and there's a door. Seems like 
the way in was found. Using those pipes of pants to turn my light back on again, it's a forever uh, working source of light. And as before, going into each alcove lets me uh, precisely get rid of one trap so that I can know if there are any others. Here, the question is, there's this area that has four walls, so how do you get in there? Phase door did not work, um, so next step is teleport. Of course, with teleport, it's hard to tell when you've moved, when you're facing a wall, and afterwards you're facing a wall, but I've turned four directions and the auto map confirms that I teleported in there. Uh, kicking all those walls doesn't get me out. There's no non-spell way to get out, basically. Thankfully, they didn't do anything cruel, like make it an anti-magic zone where you can't cast spells so you're stuck forever. I have experienced that in this series before. Uh, so now I'm teleporting to the other, the next corner. 8 south. Which is negative 8 north in this game. That's just how teleporting works, is you... It chooses the directions, and you have to choose north, negative or positive. Um, and I successfully landed in the next box, which again had nothing in it. Now it's time to teleport 8 to the east. It was counting, I wasn't sure that this level was symmetrical, even though it is. Once more, we've landed in a little room with four solid walls. And there's one left. So in Bard's Tale 1, I would say, um, well, I don't think they made many of these I don't think they did much of this. I don't think they gave you places that could only be teleported into. Bard's Tale 1 was relatively free in allowing you to use phase door and teleport. Or not expecting you to ever use it. And if you did, kind of letting you go a lot of places unless they were important. Um, but Bard's Tale... And there were very few inaccessible locations. Um, without using phase door or teleport. Uh, and if the only ones I can think of offhand that you could access with them but not, you know, that you could phase door into were like in the cellars where there was no expectation that you would ever go into those places. I certainly did because I checked every single square that was accessible in the game because um, I'm like that. But in Word Steel 2, which I, you know, came, I played more of than this game, any area that was sort of inaccessible like this was very likely to have a special message or a clue or an encounter. So I've been trained to, if there's something that you can't go to normally, go to it somehow. Uh, but for whatever reason, the map design in this game is largely of a different nature. Uh, if something is not accessible, frequently you don't need to access it. Um, so I don't know, I just wasted my time with checking all those out, but it felt pleasantly completest. So this fight, uh, I was mostly curious about the Octomech. I don't remember if I fought steel gyros earlier, but I assume they were just typical cannon fodder. But somehow Octomech caught my eye for, you know, it's one enemy, it's at 90 feet. Um, it seemed like it would be something to pay attention to, to gauge the threat of. Uh, to intentionally... So I 
I kept this one in while recording. And he, whatever, I did my usual pattern. Uh, my frontliners tried to stab something useful. Um, I, and then I did, of course, Fatal Fist and two Mangor's Mallets. And then I slowed it down because primarily I wanted to see what does an Octomech do. I kind of wondered, is it an octopus made out of mechanic? You know, is it an octopus-like robot? Or is it some sort of mech with eight arms? I don't think I'm going to get the satisfaction on that, but uh, I did want to see what its actions were. Stone blades still work, I guess. That's nice. Um, those spells are finally, you know, taking down. This is the normal pattern. When the when the third spell swings by, things are really dying at that point. The Octomex stays up though. At least for the second round. Stabbing those siphons, play uh, kills overture, hide as usual. Oh no, I had Elena stab a magic siphon. And then more rounds of spells. So I guess the only things I've really noticed about it so far are it resists spells pretty well and it uses a breath attack on my party from 90 feet away. And the breath attack does around 150 damage. So that's not a super threatening monster, but if there were a group of them, that would be pretty bad. Just in general, uh, Having breath attacks that go that far is pretty rare. Okay, so there I just picked up my loot. Uh, the interesting bit was the diamond suit. Uh, the immediate question, of course, is who wears a diamond suit? Um, would it be mage gear? I mean, it doesn't sound like heavy, clanky stuff, but it, my mage picked it up and she can't wear it. So um, it's time to see who can wear it. Uh, I managed to clear some space on a mage. This is where I finally noticed the crystal gems have numbers on them. Thinking, I wonder what they do if they're the same as harmonic gems. Turns out, yes. <laughs> That's the answer, yes. Uh, so making space on my rogue, I can now hand uh, the, the diamond suit over. Because Elena sure needs improved armor class. I mean, yeah, she hides, and that's nice, and she doesn't get attacked when hidden, but when she attacks, she becomes unhidden. Anyway, she can't wear the diamond suit either. Um, this is pretty perplexing, because... Would a diamond suit be better than diamond mail? Probably not. And I'm getting it at a point in the game where my warriors already have gone past diamond plate. Like, they... They found diamond plate, they wore it, they got better than diamond plate, they stopped wearing it. So something that sounds less protective, that's dropping now, that's a new item, very curious. So, uh, 
Um, I was trying to give it to my bard. See if she could wear it. She was at full inventory, make space. So this make space thing is what I feel like could be improved about this game series. Maybe there are other ways to solve it, like exchange items. Anyway, bards can't use it either. I think I, at some point I tried to use, yeah, there they am trying to use it as an item. So can't equip it, not something you can use as an item. I guess it's time to pass it over to a warrior type character. Warriors can equip it, so okay. Might as well see what happens when I equip it. And Grisnok's armor class jumps by 15 points, which is very confusing. Like, how could it be 15 points better than Tongue Plate? Oh, I still have Tongue Plate equipped. Tongue Plate is equipped, and the Diamond Suit is equipped. So somehow she's wearing the Diamond Suit as, like, clothing and the Tongue Plate on top. And that provides better armor somehow. It's a big boost, actually. She went from being uh, significantly below Chantrell and a bit below Lady Oakenshield to absolutely the best armor in the party. And if I turn my protective bard song back on again, I don't remember how it fell off. She's at negative 48. But negative 48, you know, that's not good enough. Let's see if we've bothered to cast Shadow Shield. And no, we have not. So we have our first party member to hit the negative 50 armor class. Uh, for anyone who's tuning in newish, this follows old D&D rules. You know, the original D&D, the black and bl three little books, and basic and AD&D and uh, AD&D version 2 all had armor that started at 10 and went down and the further down it went the better it was so um, this is basically 60 points above the starting position for armor which that sounds kind of arbitrary and it is arbitrary but it was sort of fun at the time because we were calibrated from Dungeons and Dragons to think that like 10 was bad and 0 was very 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 good. So having something be... and if you got like totally ridiculously kitted out, you know, you had like all kinds of crazy magic items that you found in ancient shrines and who knows, you know, maybe you have an armor class of negative 3 or negative 4 it would be like, you know, crazy, crazy good. More typical very very good it uh would be like minus one so having these games where you achieve minus 50 was fun for us because we were calibrated to believe that these were godlike numbers and not sort of arbitrary numbers they were like unattainably powerful numbers uh, the game doesn't really play to that it's really just numeric inflation across the series but um gave a little bit of a sense that we were, that this third game was a bit of an epic quest as compared to um, the earlier ones. I mean, they were sort of trying to be epic quests too, but the sense of scale in the, in the story and the sense of scale in the numbers kind of went together to suggest uh, a much higher stakes scenario. And it's, you know, it's a little shallow, but whatever, I enjoyed it. I still kind of enjoy it, you know. Here I am playing it. So we finished mapping the entirety of the outside of um, this space. Uh, I mean, I haven't gone up the east wall yet, which I'm doing right now. And these monsters annoy me, so let's run away. Uh, but... Once we're done with the east wall, it's time to kind of venture into the 
juicy interior. Like, reaching the center of a Tootsie Pop. As expected, there was nothing over there. I also verified that I had the distance on the odds correct, that they were all, in fact, one in from the corrugated space. So there's our quiet space. And I expected this to be kind of open inside. I don't know why. I kind of thought there would be a big open space, but um, there's a little corridor. I don't know. Not really significant, but it just made me think instead of uh, we're going to find a big open space to, oh, it's going to be like a little enclosed dungeon. Um, a little close bunch of rooms. Both were wrong. Uh, <laughs> momentarily, we're, we're going to see what really happens. Seated on a scrap metal throne, you see Ermac. His iron features seem to move like flesh, and his expression is one of sorrow. This is giving me shades of Alas, Poor Yurik from Hamlet. Not the, you know, edifice of evil that I was sort of expecting. Is this how it will end? In violence? Or can we work out an accommodation? This is confusing because he says, is it going to end in violence or can we work out an accommodation? And then yes, no. So I don't like, uh, uh, I assume that yes means the second half, but, uh, I kind of was a little unsure here and I made a save state because I didn't know which answer was supposed to mean what. I picked yes because I wanted to work on an accommodation. If anyone in a game feels shows remorse and asks to solve things peacefully, I pretty much always pick that. I don't know if that's what everyone does, um, but it's how I tend to play games. Pharaoh Fist created me, despite the gods' pact barring further creation, and through this heinous act, helped free the Dark One. But what of me? I have done no evil except to live. I have in turn created others of my kind to protect me, and so I will not be all alone. The items you seek are in my inner sanctum. I have no need of them, and they are yours to take. I have discovered a type of magic I will share with you, if you're willing. Those who wish to learn my magic should meet me at the rear of my sanctum. There I will instill this new power into your blood. In into your blood sounds a little unsettling. With that, Ermac leaves. I missed the second half. A scrap metal throne is here. There is no sign of Ermac anywhere. He's really fast. Um, it's not a super realistic um, negotiation scenario. It's not like, like you know, basically he says do you want to be peaceful? And we say yes. And he's like, okay, I'll give you a bunch of stuff. You know, it's not digging very far down into the realm of um, I don't know, like, I tend to I can create this to a game like Fallout where in order to kind of like make peace like this, you would kind of have to show everyone that you'd, you'd have to establish trust and do things and connect say things that make people be willing to trust each other or be willing to cooperate. Um, but I don't think that game design had had that framework at the time. Like, I don't think that anyone had explored those kinds of spaces. I don't think this was really completely at the cutting edge. Uh, although, um, compared to earlier Square 
you know, tile-based... Well, compared to Wizardry and its children, uh, I think it was out there. I suppose Ultima was really leading the way. I spent a while looking for a good tile that would be a throne. Uh, all I found was a bed, which was not really... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really what I was looking for. So in the end, I went with just the NPC icon. Excuse me. Um, here I'm just, you know, wandering around the room, seeing if there's anything else special. The answer is, nope, there's not. Already, I'm assuming, like in my mind, there's the assumption, there's a new kind of magic? Oh, this must be Geomancers. The manual told you there was a... Oh, Ermex Private Sanctum is a beautiful world of symmetrical medical, metal, metal tubes, jeweled globes, and silvery tools. Here you sense great power and feel a facet of magic you have never sensed before. That's just reinforcing. Geomancer, Geomancer, Geomancer! The manual says, you know, uh, your fighters can become geomancers later in the game at a time that you will find. So I already expected that there would be something like this, and once Ermac starts talking about magic, I feel pretty certain of that. It actually um, turns out that you can fight Ermac, and if you fight Ermac, that is one way to collect Pharaoh Fist's helm and the hammer of something or other <laughs> power. Uh, but if you do that, you will never get Geomancers. Um, so it's a pretty big blow. Uh, I, it maybe weakens the game design because it kind of tells you that that's the wrong decision. But you might not know, you might not realize and just keep going and only much later in the game towards the end realize, oh, I must have I must have missed something. Among the cold steel furniture that adorns Ermac's treasure chamber is a treasure chest. Ferrifus Helm is in the chest. Who wants to get it? And the Hammer of Wrath is in the chest. So those were our two items we needed to complete this world. Which means we're basically done in Canestia, except I want a Geomancer. Uh, now the Geomancer, I guess I'll wait until he tells us a little bit because he's gonna tell us in a moment. Theoretically, we could um, turn three of our party members, our current party members, to a Geomancer. Ermac stands before a strange magical machine, he says. Oh, and I'm busy trying to fix my map. It's time to write machine on the map. This machine will instill into a warrior, bard, paladin, hunter, or monk the ability to use magic. You will be more than a warrior. You will be a geomancer. But know this, you will lose some of your fighter abilities and skills, but the magic you possess will be more than make up for the loss. Specifically, you lose multiple attacks, so you will get only one attack, so your damage for uh, monk, warrior, paladin, go into the toilet. For a hunter, you lose your critical attacks that are built in, uh, which is not so important. You could be using a stone blade, but that's why I don't have a hunter at all. So I, we could. So in our party, theoretically, Chantrell could become a um, geomancer, but that's a terrible idea because she'd lose her bard songs, and those are very strong. So it's up to Grisnak and Lady Oakshield, where we could have one of the two become a geomancer, or we could have them both become a geomancer. 
later in the game, the warrior's stabby stab doesn't very relevant. So there's a lot of potential value in having both of them become geomancers. But when they become geomancers, they become level one, um, which means for the most part, their saving throws and chance to hit goes into the trash. Uh, even though they can probably wear almost all the same equipment. Paladins who become Geomancers cannot wear Paladin-specific gear anymore, I think. I'm not using any Paladin-specific gear at the moment, I don't think. So, those are the trade-offs. Uh, ultimately, I think that I should have... I, I maybe should make them both into Geomancers, but I'm kind of unexcited about both making them both into Geomancers at once. Uh, because that makes it more likely that um, I won't be able to kill things that I pull into melee range reliably. And it makes it more likely that they'll be able to be both taken out by spell attacks. So, in the end, um, Grismak it is. Ermac reaches out and caresses your temples with his copper fingers. You feel a tingle, and you have been changed. I was imagining this was going to be like a Cyberman operation, like, you know, something like maybe my head cut open and stuff changed around, but uh, it's remarkably painless. So, now that we have our Geomancer, we should probably look at the Geomancer spells. Oh, well first, none of our equipment is on her. Her armor class went to the toilet and I was worried that uh, she would be unable to wear stuff or have a terrible armor class or something, but it's just a matter of re-equipping everything. Um, I don't know exactly why they take them off you, I guess maybe for that paladin reason. That you could, you know, have paladin gear that geomancers can't wear. There might be, you know, whatever. The programmers had their reasons. Back to negative 50. Where I should be. And there at the end you could see the list of spells she has. It's entertaining that she's a spellcaster at this point in the game with a total of 25 spell points. And that's the big downside of Geomancers, is you get them late, so their level is low, and their intelligence is often low, so their spell point pool is bad. So looking at the Geomancer spells uh, in the online manual, uh, we have Earth Dagger, Earth Song, and Earth Ward. There's a common theme there, I trust you can see. Uh, Earth Dagger is a 40 range spell that hits a group for 200 to 800 damage, which is um, pretty efficient. That's five spell points for about 500 damage to a group. Not a real standard at this point in the game. Uh, and the cheapness is of course offset by the fact that she only has 25 spell points. Anyway, that aside, the next spell is Earth Song, reveals all booby trapped areas that can injure the party. Presumably this means on the map all the traps are marked. We'll try it out in the next session. Uh, Earth Ward, meanwhile, casts the trap spe spell on the entire level. So it's kind of curious why these both are here, because if you can remove all the traps, why do you need to know where they are? There might be a reason for this. Uh, maybe you have to know where they are before you can remove them. Uh, or maybe they just want to help you make nice maps. I like to make nice maps, so I'm going to be using Earth Song and putting all the traps on the map. But uh, it will make my faffing around with traps go a little faster. So we're now done with Kinestia, basically. Uh, so we could just leave. But my completionism knows no bounds, and I want to explore those areas uh, that we haven't been to on the level. Phase door doesn't work. 
uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, but teleporting in does. And it seems like it's a pretty much open space within those boundaries. Uh, I can't readily tell if there's an... Well, I guess I can tell. There's no nothing telling me that there's an odd, so that means there's an odd pretty much everywhere. We must have landed on an odd, basically, is what I'm trying to say. But uh, since we got a fight, and since we have new Geomancer abilities, let's try them out. But there's enough enemies that I'm not going to skip over the abilities of the rest of my party. I'm not going to just stand there and take a beating. So this does mean that we are going to have to see a lot of scroll from other members of the party. I'm expecting that for a spell that does from 200 to 800 damage, it'll probably end up having the actual results land in the middle, somewhere around 500. But I don't know how the, um, you know, how the weighting is done, how the rolling plays out. I've slowed it down so that hopefully we can see um, Grisnok cast her first spell. One property of being level one, of course, is that she's also slower than the other members of the party. So she's probably going to be going last-ish for a while. There she goes, doing about 500-ish damage, killing one enemy, but whatever. Um, it's a start. So having skipped the rest of the combat since nothing interesting was going to happen, <laughs> I didn't bother casting more of her spells. Uh, I start exploring, and the first thing I find is a spell point drain location. Um, and then some more, and some more. Now, spell point drain, for the last while, has been kind of inconsequential to me. Uh, you know, I'll have spell point hills like 500, I can walk through a bunch of spell point drains, and still have plenty to go. Uh, but. My Geomancer is newly vulnerable to them. Step in just a couple and almost all her spell points are gone. It's kind of unfortunate, um, but it's just going to be how it is. I'm going to have to start building up spell point regeneration for her so that um, she's more resilient. Uh, with five spell points doing a lot of damage, just a little bit of spell regeneration will go a long way. Anyway, uh, I keep exploring this internal space, and of course, every Audi alcove is a spell point drain, so I don't even bother to refill. Because um, why? <laughs> I'll just get drained again. Because, you know, of course, I'm going to teleport over to the other side and explore the rest of the uh, inaccessible space. I think there were there was like um, like in wizardry. I think there were locations that were solid walls. So um, if you teleported then the, into them, you would all instantly die. <laughs> um, wizardry was a kind of harsher game than this one. Here, you either always uh, succeed. At teleporting where you want or nothing happens at all. Anyway, it's, it's not terribly surprising. Uh, every alcove on this side is a spell point drain too. But we have just enough left at the end to teleport out. Or enough anyway.
And there is our completed map. Which, I don't know about you, but I find oh so satisfying. Okay, so to get out of this place, uh, all we really should need to do... Well, I don't know how teleporting works in Canestia. Like, if I teleport off the edge of a map, do I go to the next one? I don't really think so. However, the Viscous Plane and Ermex Parallelogram and the Workshop are all one coherent space. So I should be able to teleport pretty directly up towards the entrance to the workshop. All I really have to do is reverse the coordinates of where I am. Now, there's a little bit of weirdness with the coordinates here, right? I like saw the scenario where uh, 0 south abuts 2 south. Um, so i a little uncertain of that. I give a little extra to the north as my tell I just want it to work. I don't need to land exactly on the exit square. And continuing with the strange map behavior, uh, going one extra north here gives us a location of Two extra north. Okay, whatever. All we have to do is go west one and south two to get out of the workshop. And now we're in the main section of Canestia, and uh, using my maps. Uh, coordinates, I think all I have to do is go 13 to the west and 17 to the south. That's a big space, actually. I don't know, I guess maybe it only seems big in this game, like... Bart's Tale 1 and 2, every zone was 22 by 22. Whereas here, 17 by 15 seems enormous. I was just double checking my numbers. Of course, the way I did this, it's hard to know whether a set of numbers was meant for one side of a line or another. So a little paranoia doesn't hurt. And here we are at the warp in spot. The next question is obviously, what is the name of the Chronomancer spell? Because I do not remember. I take a get. I think, oh, it's the fourth one. Maybe it's inverse of the first, so it's Arbo backwards, Obra. Will that work? Turns out that is correct. Hooray! Okay, so at this point, it's just uh, a quick trip back to the old man where we'll turn in our uh, helm and hammer of wrath and give the old man the news that yet another one of his agents, his pawns, his um, demigods that he wished to call on to handle the situation is dead. And I get stuck uh, waylaid by some black hobbits, which reminds me to use the bard song that stops all encounters. And from here I'll meet you at the old man. The old man's eyes narrow as you tell of Ferrofis's end. An alliance with the Dark One, did he say? It is well that he realized his folly in the end. He pauses for a second, and you see an utter weariness send a tremor through him. Now to Tenebrosia for all of you. Remember, in the land where night is day and day is night, nothing is as you know it to be. Paradox lives there. Trust no one but yourselves. From there, I require the Helm of Justice and Sidu's Cloak. I'm assuming that's how you say S-C-A-A-D-U? Sidu? Anyway. And there's our experience, and with a wave of his hand, he re-energizes us. But I still need to 
have my chronomancer chat with him. Tenebrosia can be reached by uttering Oluk, and by the special spell to return is Isia. This is weird because all the spells so far have been like to go to Arborea type Arbo, and to go to Kinestia type Kinney, and the other ones are reversed, you type. And Oluk doesn't sound like Tenebrosia at all. So, not sure what that's about. Anyway, we need to take down uh, our quest goals. So I'm typing them in just to keep track. So the southeast is Shadow Rock. Your passage to Tenebrosia is there. And now it's time to go ahead and level up. First, Grisnok, our new Geomancer, who should get several levels. Luck and Constitution and Intelligence, and that's it. Uh, so that puts her to level four. She can gain a new spell level of Geomancy. Level two. I'm, I think I forget to look at the spells, so we'll talk about them next time. It's a little strange that the old man can teach us geomancy, but I guess the old man is a mysterious character. And now for Lady Oak Shield, we get four levels. Uh, that makes me suddenly realize that um, I missed out on four levels of experience for Grisnok. Probably I would go back off camera and level up again independently and then get geomancy. But. Uh, Chantrell gets four levels, Constitution, Intelligence. Elena gets a very focused set of uh, stat gains. It's, it's really four levels all around. When I did this live, of course, I read them in time. Now it's hard. But uh, I wondered, because I got so many IQ points, Am I maxed out on stats? So I started checking some of the characters, and no one's maxed out on stats, nor, nor nearly maxed out. I think I'm going to finish the game without coming close to 30s and all of them. And so... Those are all our level ups. Uh, our hit point and spell, our spell, our hit point totals on Elena are still pretty unimpressive. She got a few Constitution points right there, though, so that should help. Um, at least going forward, doesn't help that much right now. Um, my spell point totals on my mages are a little improved. I don't seem to be having any trouble with them though, because I get so many uh, harmonic gems that. Spellcasting seems to be pretty much unlimited in a really long, difficult fight, which we basically don't ever have so far. Um, I could run out, but uh, losing a single round of combat wouldn't be a big deal. Anyway, I'm going to go on back to the Adventurer's Camp, and uh, what I'm going to do there is shuffle equipment around, mostly dropping the keys and unnecessary items from the last session. And I will see you after that's done in Tenebrosia.